Mysteries and Secrets of the Past, which, which I've come across in the course of my research. But I'm going to start with a story. Uh, I'm an author, so I guess it's only fitting I should start with a story. And I'm going to take you back to Paris in 1868. Try and picture this in your mind. There is a caretaker of a building who walks up to the top floor of the building to a row of small rooms in which the poor people of Paris, the people who can't afford houses, they rent these rooms. And he's trying to investigate the strange disappearance of one of the people, one of the men who's living in those rooms. So he comes to the door of this man, he knocks on the door, there's no answer. The door is locked from inside, so he decides to break open the door. And when he enters the room, he sees the usual state of the room. It's a small, dark, dingy, squalid room, dirty, with one table, one chair, one bed, and a coal gas stove. And on the bed, he sees the body of a young man, a 29-year-old man whose name was Abel Babel. Now, one glance at the, at the body and the caretaker knows that Abel Babel has taken his own life because the windows are all shut, the door was shut, and the coal gas stove is on. So, he's obviously suffocated himself to death. But why? Why did this 29-year-old man take his own life? Was it because he was lonely? Which he was. Was it because he was poor, which he also was? And the investigation into the, into the death of Abel Babe basically reinforced the fact that he had taken his life. But it was the medical report, the medical examination, that proved to be most interesting. And of course, in the 19th century, uh, science was not that advanced, so they didn't understand what we understand today in the 21st century. But the medical reports showed that one of the possible causes of, or the reasons why Abel Barber took his own life was because of an error that had happened 30 years earlier. In April 1838, this error was a genetic mutation. So we know this in the 21st century. In that time, they didn't know it. But we know now that there was a genetic mutation which led to the failure of a single enzyme in the body of Abel Babe. What did this have to do with his death? Why did he commit suicide? The medical reports very interestingly show us that when Abel Babe's mother held her newborn baby for the first time, did, did The medical reports show that when Abel Baba's mother held her newborn baby for the first time, she did not hold a baby boy, but she held a baby girl. Abel Baba was born a girl, but he died a man. Now, in case you're wondering if this is a nice story, fictional, why, how can something like this happen? I will come back to this. But as someone who's been researching the Mahabharata for a long time, there are lots of questions which come to us because the usual term we use to refer to the Mahabharata is mythology. Whereas the Mahabharata itself, in, in multiple occasions, uses the word itihasa. Now, itihasa in Sanskrit does not mean history. It means closely translated, very loosely translated, it's very difficult to get an exact English translation of the word Itihasa. But the closest translation is, this is what happened. And if the, if the Mahabharata insists that it is a record of things that did happen, some questions come to, come to mind. Did some of those fantastical events, is it possible that they could have happened? How? How could people living so long ago, thousands of years ago, have had the kind of technology and knowledge that is described in the Mahabharata? We, we you know, have examples like Vimanas, invisibility shields, Karan's kabach and, and his earrings. 
right? All of these things, Ashwatthama's gem, which protected him from illness, all of these things are difficult to explain. How did, you know, how could this happen? And then you have these weapons, these fantastic so-called celestial weapons, the Devastras, which were usually given by the Devas to human beings and they were trained in their use. Is it possible that these kinds of weapons could actually have existed? And finally, were they really giants in the Mahabharata? We have heard a lot about big people, really big people, quite apart from the Rakshasas. You have the Asuras, you have the Devas, they themselves were big people, they lived for thousands of years, could they have actually existed? Now, we don't have answers to all these questions. If we had, we wouldn't be calling the Mahabharata mythology. But I explore these through fiction in my books in the Mahabharata Quest series, which are basically thrillers set in modern times. And they explore these connections between science, history, and the Mahabharata. But today, today I'm going to be talking about facts, not fiction. Uh, a lot of the facts that underlie the stories in my books. I'm going to start by taking you on a very quick tour around the world, deep in the past. And it's important because we're, you will see why when we, we look at what was happening on Earth in different parts of the world thousands of years ago, it is relevant when we start looking at the Mahabharata. Then I'll come back and connect the dots for you. So let us start with Egypt. This is the Great Pyramid which is a very familiar site. Everyone's seen this photograph, right? If you haven't, even if you haven't seen the pyramid. But this is a magnificent monument. We are told that the Great Pyramid was built by a pharaoh called Khufu, and that he built it as a tomb for himself. Now, it's interesting when you consider that one of the grandest tombs in the world, the Taj Mahal in India, is eight stories in height, right? It's got four stories underground and four stories above the ground. It's eight stories in height. The Great Pyramid is 457 feet in height. It is the height of a 45-story building. The Taj Mahal is a small dinky toy in front of the Great Pyramid. And then when you consider that Khufu lived 4,500, more than 4,500 years ago, we have been told by Egyptologists and historians and archaeologists that Khufu in 2550 BC built a 45-story skyscraper as a tomb for himself. And then strangely, the original entrance to the Great Pyramid was sealed. This is the original entrance. It was hidden away for hundreds of years. There was no way to get inside the Great Pyramid. Even today, you can't use this entrance to go inside because if you look very closely, you will see that there are granite plugs. There are huge stone blocks blocking the entrance. In fact, in 820 AD, the Caliph Abdullah al Mamun decided he wanted to go inside the Great Pyramid, but obviously there was no entrance that anyone knew of. So, being the Caliph, he decided to make an entrance in the north face of the pyramid. And this is the entrance that tourists use today when you want to enter the Great Pyramid and look inside. Coincidentally, maybe by accident, al Mamun made his entrance directly below the original entrance of the Great Pyramid. Now, he didn't know where the original entrance was. So maybe by accident, he managed to find a place which allowed him access to the passages of the Great Pyramid, as I just showed you. Now, we don't know why al Mamun wanted to go inside. There are two schools of thought. One school of thought says that he wanted to loot the treasures that would have been buried with Kufi, because all Egyptian pharaohs were buried with lots of treasure. The more charitable, the kinder school of thought says, no, Abdullah al Mamun was a man of science. And at that time, the Arabic world was very, very uh, heavily into science, they were quite advanced. So he wanted the secret knowledge that was supposed to be hidden inside the Great Pyramid. Now, whatever the reason, al Mamun was in for a bit of a shock when he reached inside the Great Pyramid because the pyramid was empty. Forget Kofu, no one had ever been buried in the Great Pyramid. And here's a bit of trivia. There are more than 80 pyramids in Egypt, and none of them have been used for contemporary burial. When I say contemporary burial, no one was buried in them when they were built. There have been people buried in them maybe a hundred or thousand years after they were built, but they were not built as burial chambers. So this was interesting. He reached inside, there was nothing over there, except 
for a very mysterious network of passages and chambers. And there are three key chambers in the Great Pyramid. There's an underground chamber, which is right at the bottom. You have the mid middle chamber called the Queen's Chamber, and the top chamber called the King's Chamber. And the, these are random ad hoc names thought of by the Arabs because of the shape of the chambers. <clears throat> because the Queen's Chamber resembled tombs in which women were buried in the 9th century, and the King's Chamber resembled tombs in which men were buried at that point in time. So they called it the King's Chamber, the Queen's Chamber. Now this is very strange. I'm sure uh, if you're observant, you would have noticed this. That there is only one horizontal passage in the entire Great Pyramid. And that is the one leading to the Queen's Chamber. And they call it the horizontal passage because it's the only one. All of the other passages are at these almost impossible angles of 26 or 27 degrees. Steep inclines. Let me show you. Let's start with the Grand Gallery. This is the one with the highest ceiling in the Great Pyramid, the passage where we have the highest ceiling, and this is what it looks like. And you can see how steep it is. Now today for tourists, they have these wooden stairs and you know, handrails so you can climb, but in the olden days, before all of this, you can see how difficult it would be to climb up the plain stone floor of the Grand Gallery. Uh, considering that this leads to the king's chamber where the king was supposed to have been buried, it's not a very easy way to carry a king's body up to the king's, to the burial chamber, right? Let me show you some more stuff. Let's look at the entrance to the king's chamber. You enter the king's chamber through a small room called the ante room. And that's the ante room. And let's, let's zoom in on this and have a look, closer look. So now you can see, you walk through the grand gallery and you can walk through it up, right? But to get into the antechamber, you have to get down on your hands and knees. And then to get into the king's chamber, again, you have to crawl through a small passageway which leads to the king's chamber. This opening here on the right hand side is the entrance to the king's chamber. And you can see with the gentleman standing next to it that there's no way you can possibly walk into the king's chamber. You have to crawl into it. More passages like this. There's the entrance of the King Queen's Chamber. Let me show this to you again. It's just below the Grand Gallery, that little opening over there. Again, something you have to crawl through. And uh, there are stranger things in the Great Pyramid. So, for example, in the Queen's Chamber itself, you have this little, can you see the little hole in the wall? You can see it now. And in um, September 2002, a robot was sent in, a rover to try and figure out what lay behind that wall, which has two, uh, what look like handles, but they're basically copper strips, which are attached to that wall. So the rover drilled that hole, and lo and behold, there's a small chamber beyond it, with yet another door. So that's what archaeologists call it. They call this a door, and there's another door. What other secrets is the Great Pyramid hiding? So here's one secret which a lot of people don't know about. I'm sure you all know that a pyramid has four sides, right? But the Great Pyramid has eight. This is a photograph which was taken, this is the first aerial photograph of the Great Pyramid taken about 100 years ago, and that's a Great Pyramid. The one below is the Pyramid of Kafe, Kufu's son. And you can very clearly see with the sun shining on it at a certain angle, you can see that there are two faces. Each of the sides of the Great Pyramid has two faces. There are eight sides to the Great Pyramid. This is a more modern photograph. Again, it's an aerial photograph. You can see the line running down. This is the south face of the Great Pyramid. Again, trivia. That hole on the south face is where al Bahun first tried to get into the Great Pyramid. He tried to dig in from there. He didn't succeed. But more importantly, there you can see the eight sides. And this is interesting. You can only see the eight sides of the, of the Great Pyramid from the air. You cannot see it when you're standing in front of it on the ground. Let's walk over to the Sphinx, which is a little, uh, it's, it's not very far from the Great Pyramid. Now the Sphinx itself, we are told, was built in 2500 BC by Kafe, Khufu's son. And the face of the Sphinx is supposed to be the face of Kafe. Now the Sphinx by itself is huge. 240 feet in length, 66 feet in height. It's the height of a seven-story building. And as long as it has been there, 
It spent time covered in sand. We're just the face visible. Now, 1991, a scientist, Dr. Robert Schock, was called to Egypt to investigate this claim that the Sphinx was built in 2500 BC. So they wanted a scientist to check this out. And Schock spent, Schock is a geologist. At that time, in 91, he was a professor of geology at Boston University. And uh, he's a double PhD in geology. So he spent one year running tests on the Sphinx. Geological tests, seismic tests, all kinds of scientific tests. And in 1992, he made an announcement based on his testing, which caused a lot of controversy. What did he say? I'll show you rather than tell you. If you look at the body of the Sphinx, you will see there's horizontal marks, the horizontal lines, channels on the Sphinx. And if you look at the wall of the enclosure around the Sphinx, here's a close-up, you can again see horizontal channels and vertical cracks in the, in the walls. All of these are caused by erosion. Now, considering that Egypt is so dry, it's next to the Sahara, it's very, very dry, arid, one would assume that all of this erosion was caused by wind or sand. But Robert Schock said otherwise. He said his tests showed him that all of this erosion was caused by heavy rainfall. And this is why it became controversial, because in 2500 BC, when Khafre was ruling Egypt, Egypt was as dry as it is today. There was no possibility of this kind of erosion happening after that. The last time it has really rained heavily in Egypt, enough to cause this kind of erosion, was in the 3000 year period between 5000 and 8000 BC called the Neolithic Subluvial. So Robert Schock was essentially saying that the Sphinx was not built in 2500 BC, but it was built maybe 7,000 years ago or even before. It's at least 7,000 years old. And then that, that actually creates another mystery. If Hafre did not build the Sphinx 4,500 years ago, the Sphinx was built 7,000 or 8,000, 9,000 years ago. Who built it? Let me now take you to England on the plains of Wiltshire. They've got this amazing, awesome, magnificent monument, which we call Stonehenge. It's really awe-inspiring because each of these standing stones and the ones on top, so the standing stones are about 25 feet in height, and these stones and the stones on top in the outer circle of Stonehenge weigh approximately 70 tons each, 7-0. These are huge, heavy blocks of stone. Now, I was, I spent, in 2015, I spent a week at Stonehenge with two archaeologists. I was researching for my book, The Secret of the Druids. And uh, I asked them a bunch of questions, and they gave me lots of answers. One of the questions I asked them is, how did they build Stonehenge? How did they lift these 70 ton blocks of stone, 25 feet in the air, and put them on top? Because you must remember, Stonehenge is 2,400 BC, 4,400 years old. So the archaeologists gave me a very, very good explanation. They said, <clears throat> well, you had a hundred men lifting each block, block of stone using ropes and pulleys, so they were able to lift it and put it on top, which is fair. But the problem came when we started looking at the engineering of Stonehenge. Yes, there is engineering there. And uh, let me explain to you, because for me, this was the big mystery about Stonehenge, when we talk about how was it built. Each of the standing stones has these two projections, which are known as tenon. Any, anyone familiar with carpentry here? Yeah? So you know what I'm talking about. They, you have tenons here, and you've got mortise holes on top. This is a, called a mortise tenon joint in carpentry, which is logical because Stonehenge originally was not a stone circle. It was a wooden circle. You had wooden posts instead of the stone slabs you see today. So it's quite possible that they started with the, the wooden carpentry joints and then applied the same thing to the stone. So basically, a mortise tenon joint locks stones in place, like kind of like a Lego set does. But the builders of Stonehenge didn't stop there. They had something called a tongue and groove joint, which is again a carpentry joint, at the side of each stone, which is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, locking it in place. So they built two locks for each of these stones which were on top, one at the bottom, one at the side, so that they wouldn't fall off. And this is where I could not understand. If anyone here has an idea today, after I finish, please give me those ideas, because I can't understand how they did it. I can understand 100 men lifting one of those blocks of stone and then somehow managing to make the mortise stone 
joint block. Uh, you remember, they are, there's 25 feet in the air, they can't see what they're doing, right? They're doing it blind. But then how do they lift the second 70-ton block of stone and then make both the mortise tenon and the tug and groove joint fit at the same time without being able to see what they're doing? I mean, today, if we take a little Lego set and we try and assemble it with our eyes closed, we can't do it, right? These guys were doing that with 70 ton blocks of stone. Uh, the, when I asked the archaeologist, said, we don't ask us, we are archaeologists, we aren't engineers, we can't tell you. So I said, okay, fine. I'll, I'll give up here. But let me show you some photographs that I took. Uh, you can see the water soles very clearly. You can see the tenon on one of the upright stones. And here, if you look very closely, you can see the tongue from a tongue and root joint. It's all there. Let's go across to Wales on the west coast of England. The island of Anglesey, which is where the Druids, I was doing all this research because I was writing about the Druids. Uh, the island of Anglesey, which was the headquarters of the Druids, a very mysterious set of people. And you have this place, it's supposed to be a burial chamber, again, no one has ever buried there. Um, but um, it's called Bryn Kethiti, that's how it's pronounced in Welsh. And it's very interesting now, then I could tell you lots of things. I went on the day of the solstice, uh, summer solstice, and it was fascinating. But I'll tell you just one magical thing that happens at the Rinca So every day between October and April, every day the sun shines in through this entrance. This is the entrance. And it lights up this pillar, which is inside the chamber. It's a circular chamber inside. It lights up this chamber. Now, not a big deal, right? What's the big deal about this? But you start understanding what was happening 5,000 years ago, because this is 3000 BC, when Berin Kethedi was built. You start understanding things are happening over here when you start by realizing that the pillar is not in line with the entrance. It's off to the side, where the blue line is. That's where the pillar is. So the sun shines through that entrance and lights up the pillar on the side. Again, it's not a big deal because you can do it through clever engineering. But let me tell you one thing more. If you look closely at the stone pillar, you will see that there are marks on it, there are grooves, there are notches. Can you see that? Uh, here's a close-up. Can you see the notches? And this is the, one of the magical things about Brin Kethidi. Every day between October and April, the sun shines in and every day it lights up a different notch. It climbs. In October, it's lighting up the notch at the base of the pillar. By April, the sun has reached the top of the pillar. This is not only engineering, this is sophisticated engineering. Because the inside of the chamber, and you can see this, uh, let me go back one slide. Uh, you can see the reflection of the flash on the wall behind the pillar. The inside of the chamber is a parabolic mirror. That's how they do it. But 5,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, they built a parabolic mirror, mirror using stone. And it's still around today. OK, my last stop on the archaeological tour. Baalbek, my favorite archaeological site in the world. You'll see why. So this is the wall of the Temple of Jupiter. And just to give you an, an idea of how massive this wall is, look at that man in the bottom left of this uh, corner of the screen. You probably missed him. Yeah. Yeah, you would have seen it, right? Yeah. And now you can see how huge this wall is. And here again, those two figures are there are not ants, they are men. Probably English men, they're wearing bowler hats. And this is a pretty old photograph. Now, I want to talk about these three stones at the base not the smaller stones below or on top, these three. Again, you can see that these th three stones have been lifted and put on top of this wall at a height of approximately 20 feet. It's easy to figure that out, even if you haven't been there. By looking at the men who are standing in front, you can see it's, you know, it's, it's at a height. Why am I so fascinated by these three stone blocks? Because each one of these weighs 840 tons. Stonehenge is marvelous compared to this. Someone in the past has lifted these 840 ton blocks of stone 20 feet in the air and put it on top of that wall. 
Now, archaeologists are divided. Some of them say the Romans did it 2,000 years ago. Other people say, no, it was done much earlier by someone else. But it doesn't matter. Someone did it. And why am I so uh, fascinated by this? Because this is the most powerful crane in the world we have today. It was first manufactured in 2018. Before this, we did not have the capacity to lift those stones. Before this crane was, was manufactured, this crane can lift 1,200 tons. Before this crane was manufactured in 2018, the most powerful crane in the world could lift only 825 tons. In the 21st century, we could not have built the wall. We can do it now. We could lift those stones now and build that wall, but until five years ago, we could not do it. But someone did it thousands of years ago. So it doesn't matter whether it was 2,000 or 10,000 years ago. They didn't have these cranes. And if you go to the quarry where these stones were cut and brought from, you will still see the stone over there. <clears throat> it was probably not used for construction because it has a crack. You can see the crack in the stone, so it was probably considered to be too weak to be used for construction. This one weighs 1,150 tons. And if you go around this stone, to the other side of the stone, about five years ago, another stone was discovered, still in the ground, but it's been cut out, it has not been extracted, and that one weighs 1,650 tons. So it was probably too heavy to lift, so they left it in the ground. But who, was the, who are these people who are, who are literally playing with huge stone blocks like this? And it's almost like they were trying to show off, right? I mean, wouldn't you want to cut them into smaller pieces? Smaller stone blocks and use those, like the Romans and the Arabs did later on. If you look at the, the Temple of Jupiter, you saw the small stone on top. Why are you using these huge stone blocks? And here's a very interesting thing. I want to be very clear here. I am not drawing conclusions. So please, if you draw conclusions, that's your problem. But I'm not drawing conclusions. I want to be very clear that this is most probably a coincidence, but it's a fantastic coincidence. So I do want to share this with you. If you go to Google Earth and you look at the Great Pyramid, and like any good pyramid, it's got a square base. In fact, it's, I could talk about the Great Pyramid for years. It's got so many fantastic engineering accomplishments. Uh, we cannot build a building like the Great Pyramid today in the 21st century. We don't have the technology to do it. But let's just look at this. So it's a square base. And if you draw the two diagonals pointing north, north, east, and northwest, something very strange happens. The one pointing northeast, points towards Baalbek, the temple of Jupiter, I just showed you. And the diagonal to the, to, the, to the west points directly towards Stonehenge. So obviously they didn't have a WhatsApp group saying, I'm building Stonehenge, I'm building the Great Pyramid, I'm building Ban the you know, temple of Jupiter, and you know, let's make them. But it's a fascinating coincidence, isn't it? Really amazing. OK, enough of mysteries. Let me now talk about some discoveries. And some of these discoveries are going to blow your mind. because. We don't, for some reason, they're not talked about that much. The first discovery is that we now know, based on scientific evidence, and I'll show you some of that evidence, we now know that approximately 12,000 years ago, sometime between 10,500 and 10,800 BC, an extraterrestrial body hit the Earth. So I'm going to call it a comet. Right? It could be a comet, a meteor, an asteroid. We don't know. But as the simplicity called it a comet, so as the comet passed through the Earth's atmosphere, it broke up into smaller fragments, and these fragments struck the Earth's surface at different points, and these are the points where geological samples have been found belonging to this comet. Now, you must remember that 12,000 years ago, the Ice Age had begun ending. In 15,000 15, years ago, the Ice Age had begun ending. 12,000 years ago, the ice caps were melting, sea levels were rising, but there was still a substantially thick ice cap across almost all of North America, all the way to Greenland. It was one huge ice cap. And all of Europe, upwards of Spain, was one huge ice cap. And as you can see, that almost all the samples that have been retrieved show that the comet fragments struck the ice cap. Now, they would have struck the sea also, but they haven't been retrieved. You can't retrieve them. They're somewhere under the ocean. But when they struck the ice cap, two things happened. The first was 
The ice cap with the impact and the heat melted and sea levels rose by hundreds of feet. We today have scientific evidence that there was a global flood about 12,000 years ago. Now, whether this is the flood that is present in 2,000 flood myths across the world, we, we can't be sure. It was, there are 2,000 flood myths across the world. All of them say the same thing, that there was a global flood, only a few people survived. And they have exactly the same story. It doesn't matter whether you go to Japan, Germany, India, Egypt, Sumeria, North America, anywhere you go in the world, you have these 2,000 flood myths which look exactly and sound exactly the same. So the first thing was a global flood. The second thing that happened was that with the shock and the impact of these fragments, the earth literally shook. There were earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, dust and debris got thrown up into the atmosphere so much that the sun was blotted out and there was night. An artificial winter, an artificial night that lasted 1,300 years. Today it's known as the impact winter. This event today is known as the Younger Dryas event in geological terms. It's a scientifically accepted uh, you know, event because evidence has been found. Now, what is the evidence for the impact winter that 1,300 years? I'll show you one scientific report. This is a report taken from the Greenland ice cap in the year 2000 um, by geologists who were drilling kilometers deep. You know, they analyzed samples to see what's happening uh, thousands of years ago. I just want you to look at the red line, which is the temperature. 20,000 years ago, the ice age is in full force, minus 45 degrees centigrade. Global warming starts happening around 15,000 years ago. The ice age is ending. Temperatures start rising to about minus 30 degrees centigrade. And then, suddenly, the ice age is back. Temperatures drop from minus 30 to minus 50 degrees. Geologically, this is almost overnight. And then for 1,300 years, temperatures stay around 47 to 50, minus 47 to minus 50. This is the impact winter. And you can see when the dust starts settling in the atmosphere, the sun comes up again, global warming starts again, and temperatures go back to minus 30 degrees. The second discovery I want to share with you, and this is amazing, this discovery was made in 1994, almost 29 years ago, and I still don't find it in textbooks around the world, in history textbooks. It's really amazing, 29 years, the world has turned a blind eye to this, Despite the fact that all archaeologists agree that this was built 10,000 years ago, uh, 12,000 years ago, around 9,500 or 10,000 BC, scientific dating, everyone agrees this is possibly the only archaeological site in the world where no one disputes when it was built. Everyone agrees. And yet we don't talk about it. So what is Gobekli Tepe? It's in Turkey and um, it's got stone circles. Just like Stonehenge, but a little more sophisticated than Stonehenge. And remember, this is 7,000 years before Stonehenge. They are in T-shapes, and they have all kinds of things inscribed on them. They've got these mysterious symbols, they've got inscriptions, they've got animals, which shouldn't be there because Turkey never had those animals. And most amazingly of all, these stone circles, each of these, each of these stones weighs about 15 to 20 tons, by the way. But these stone circles are all astronomically inclined. This Gobekli Tepe is an observatory. Now, 12,000 years ago, we were supposed to be hunter-gatherers. We didn't have the technology or the scientific knowledge to go around building observatories, right? And this is, this is strange because our history textbooks teach us that human civilization started 6,000 years ago, with the Indus Valley, Egypt, the Sumerian, you know, Mesopotamian civilizations. That's when, when civilization started. But Gobekli Tepe is the work of a civilized society. It is not the work of hunter-gatherers. I'm still surprised at the number of books uh, that say Gobekli Tepe was built by hunter-gatherers. They could not have come together to build something like this so many thousands of years ago. So human civilization has now, the date has been pushed back. 10,000 BC. That's when civilization started. And this is interesting because it started before the advent of agriculture. Agriculture started about 8,000 to 9,000 BC. And 
greatly that it was built before that. Who built it? We have absolutely no idea. All we know is we know when it was built. The third discovery I want to share with you. This is a photograph of a group of archaeologists in a cave in Russia called Denisova. Uh, it's named after Saint Denisova, who was a Russian saint. Now, they found some, archa some, some very interesting remains in this cave, one of which was a gigantic tooth. Now, this tooth is about two and a half times the size of our, of our teeth. So the archaeologists felt that this probably belonged to a large extinct animal, like a bear or something, a giant ancient bear. And they sent it for DNA testing to Geneva. Incidentally, the man, the scientist who did the DNA testing on this sample, won the Nobel Prize last year. Not for this. He did it, he won it for the uh, for deciphering the the Neanderthal genome. But he is the one who Swart Babu is his name. So he he did the genetic analysis, sent back his report, and the archaeologist got a shock because the DNA test results said that this tooth is a human tooth. It belonged to a child, a girl, who lived around 40,000 years ago in that cave. And she belonged to a human species which we didn't know about until 2009. Today we call them the dead souls. And here's a comparison. That's a human. When I say human, it's a modern human. These are also humans, right? Modern human mola and a dead soul mola. You can see the size difference. They're gigantic. What was interesting is, now there are lots of interesting things about the Denisovans, right? what, what was interesting about this particular find was also an artifact that was recovered, a stone bangle, a bracelet. It's nice to think that that girl would have you know, worn this 40,000 years ago. But what's really fascinating about this is this hole at the side of the bracelet, which you can see, it was probably meant for you know, tiny accessories or something, high fashion 40,000 years ago. right? Now scientists were a little puzzled because when they when they saw this bracelet, they couldn't figure out how the Denisovans could have drilled this hole in the stone without breaking the stone because this hole is just one millimeter in diameter. The hole. It's a very very fine hole. So they ran tests, and now I'm going to quote from the test results of the scientists. This is not me talking; I'm quoting their words. So this is what they say. They say that this hole could only have been made by using a two-faced drill operating at very high speed. Now, obviously, they didn't have electricity and black and decker drills back then. But they did have a drilling technology that they should not have had 40,000 years ago. Because modern humans, homo sapiens, we developed that same technology thousands of years after the Denisovans. And the Denisovans died out very mysteriously around 40,000 years ago. We don't know what killed them, but we know that they're still around in some in some shape or form because their DNA. There are people alive today, modern humans, who have Denisovan DNA. So a lot of there were hybrids that were floating around 40,000 years ago as well before the Denisovans disappeared. Now I want to also tell you what some scientists scientists speculate, and please remember this is speculation because no complete. Denisovan skeleton has been found. Bone fragments have been found. You know, cranial fragments have been found. Skull parts of the skull, uh, teeth. A couple of teeth have been found, and all of these have been huge. So some scientists like to speculate that the Denisovans were giants. Uh, they were definitely big people, and it's estimated they could have been anywhere between eight to eleven feet in height. But this is all speculation because until we find a complete skeleton we'll never really be able to know for sure. But one look at the two, then you would say that, okay, they were big. Whatever, whatever their size was, they were big people. And recently, scientists have tried to, uh, you know, using whatever remains have been found, tried to see if they could produce an image of what a Denisovan could have possibly looked like. And this is the first cut. There could be more. So what does all of this have to do with the Mahabharata? I said I'm going to come back to the Mahabharata. Now, one of the things I've always wondered is, are, are there scientific explanations? Can we actually find evidence or explanations in real science 
that could explain some of the stories from the Mahabharata, some of the events in the Mahabharata. And I'm not talking about the fiction that I write here, I'm talking about real scientific explanations. And that's why I'm going to come back to the story that I started with. The story of Abel Babbitt, who was born a girl and who died a man. So there is a scientific explanation for this. Remember I said there was a genetic mutation that happened 30 years before, uh, before he died? While he was still in his mother's womb, seven months before he was born, this genetic mutation happened. So Ibn Babe suffered from a fairly rare genetic condition, which is technically, medically called male pseudohermaphroditism. People who have this genetic condition lack an enzyme, a single enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. The absence of this enzyme means that these people with this condition are born female and at puberty they naturally spontaneously become male. It's pretty well documented. Abel Babai was possibly the first well documented case of male pseudohermaphroditism. But while I was doing this research and reading about this, I remember that there's a story in the Mahabharata which sounds uncannily similar. You know which one I'm talking about? Yeah. Yes. So there's been a lot of speculation about who Shikhandi was, and and you know, uh, and all of it has been unscientific. I'm, I'm sorry to say. So I'm I'm going to indulge a little bit of science, scientific speculation now. So for those who are not very familiar with the story, I'll quickly summarize it. King Drupad prayed to Lord Shiva for a son. And Lord Shiva said, you will be blessed with a son. So Drupad went back very happy, but when his child was born, it was a daughter. So Drupad went back, meditated again, prayed to Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva appeared to him. And, uh, and Drupad said, Lord, you promised me a son, but I have a daughter. And Lord Shiva then said something very, very strange. He said, don't worry, it will be as I said. So he got right? So even Drupad probably didn't understand it. So he, he said, oh, the Lord has said it, I'll go back. And he raised Shikandani as a son, as a boy, not as a girl. So much so that when she, when she came of marriageable age, he married her to a woman, not to a man, because she was a son. Now, obviously, when Shikandani's wife came home, she realized that she'd been married to a woman and not a man, and she raised hell, right? And uh, she, she sent word to her father. Her father was furious. Drupad has deceived me, and he decided to march against Drupad's army, uh, army against Drupad's kingdom, with his own army. Now, Shikandari was devastated. Because of her, there was going to be a war. It was a there was a possibility that her father would be captured if he did killed. So she left the palace and wandered into a forest. And she was sitting there and crying her heart out when a yaksh called Sruna <coughs> saw her. And being a nice guy, most yakshas are nice guys. So he came to her and said, What's, why are you crying? Can I do something for you? And she told me the whole story. Now, Sruna, apart from being a nice guy, also had magical powers, being a yaksha. So he told her, I have a solution, it's temporary, but I have a solution for you. I will lend you my masculinity and I will take on your femininity temporarily. So you walk out of here, go back to the palace, send off your father-in-law, say what rubbish, I'm not a woman, I'm a man, and then come back and then we'll swap again. So Shikandani was so desperate that she had no choice but to agree. She said, okay, this is, at least the war will get averted. And that's how Shikandini walked out of the forest as Shikandi or Shikandini. And it's very interesting because Shikandin played a very pivotal role in the, in the Kurukshetra war. If it had not been for him, the Pandavas would never have won the war because Bhishma would never have been killed, right? But Stuna had a problem because Kubair was angry with him for misusing his powers. He said, you've done something that's not natural. She's a girl, how can you make her a man? And he cursed Suna, saying, 
And you made a choice, and you will stay female forever, and Shikandan will be a male forever. And that's in a nutshell. Very, sim I very simply put the story of of Shikandi or Shikandan. Now, that, you know, while I was reading the Abel Baba story, I kept wondering what if Shikandan was actually a male pseudo hermaphrodite. And what the story that's been created around the origin of Shikandi? Forget about the pre, you know, the earlier birth of Amda, who was reborn as, as Shikandan, right, to take revenge on Bhishma. Forget all that. But just the whole story of Lord Shiva and, you know, and the prince and the princess, uh, uh, Shikandani to Shikandan. What if, what if this had actually happened? Can you imagine the scandal? A princess suddenly becomes a prince. What are people going to say? Right? It's only now in the 21st century that we become more understanding towards conditions and, you know, and, and people. But in those days, it could have been very different. So what if the story of Lord Shiva was created to give a divine legitimacy to something that people could not explain? Because the moment you say Lord Shiva has, has decreed that this is going to happen, no one's going to question it. Speculation, but it's uh, interesting speculation. I don't know how many of you followed this forest fire in the US in 2021. Uh, it was a massive forest fire covering millions of hectares of land and uh, it, um, uh, uh, it took weeks to put out and uh, it, was so, it was so fearsome and dreadful that firefighters were, you know, they were hesitant to go inside the forest and put out the fire. And one of the reasons was for that, the reasons why it was so risky for firefighters, you can see for yourself in the headlines that came out at that point in time. Now these are strange headlines, aren't they? How can a forest fire generate lightning and rain? Is that even possible? Yet, you have lots of reports, news reports like this, all saying the same thing, that the bootleg fire was generating thunder, lightning and rain. Again, science comes to the rescue, there is a scientific explanation for it. And I'll very quickly explain it to you. So, when, when there's a forest fire that does not get controlled and it spreads, the smoke turns into clouds. Because it, you know, the smoke just grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And those clouds of smoke eventually become so big that scientists have a name for them. They call them pyrocumulus. So cumulus clouds, we already know, we're familiar with the normal cumulus clouds. Pyro means born of fire. So these are cumulus clouds which are not natural, but they are formed from a fire. These are clouds of smoke. And as the pyrocumulus clouds grow bigger and bigger, they become what are known as pyrocumulum nimbus clouds. And it is these clouds which NASA calls the fire-breathing dragon of clouds. These clouds can generate lightning strikes and rain. So these are pyrocumulus clouds. To give you an idea how big they are, from base to tip, they can measure six miles. And pyrocumulus pyrocumulus nimbus clouds are even bigger than this. They're huge clouds. And this is how the science really works. The fire starts, it gets uncontrollable. The clouds, uh, the fire, the smoke, you know, the clouds of smoke grow bigger and bigger and bigger until you get the pyrocumulus nimbus clouds which cause a downburst. And this is, I'm actually preempting a question because I always get asked, how come the, the rain doesn't put out the fire? And this is the reason why. The pyrocumulus nimbus, pyrocumulus nimbus clouds cause a downburst. This downburst pushes air violently towards the earth, scattering the embers and fueling the fire. The fire grows bigger and bigger. And that's where the lightning and rain starts. Now, okay, what's this got to do with the Mahabharata? So, when I was reading uh, about this, the bootleg fire, I kept thinking back to some shlokas from the Mahabharata. Now, can anybody tell me what I'm going, where I'm going with this? You know what I'm talking about? Which, which incident? Any guesses? Lakshagrah. Sorry? Lakshagrah. No. Sorry. Yeah? Maybe the warfare? No. Okay, I'll tell you. So, this is a reference to a forest fire in the Mahabharata. And I'm going to show you the shlokas which I started remembering 
Could it be the Khanda Prasth? Yeah. yeah. The Khanda Prasth. So I'm going to show you the shlokas that came to my mind when I was reading the Bhutai Fat. And you're free, please feel free to, you know, to take away whatever you want. I'm just showing you what I what I, I saw in them. And I will translate the shlokas for you, of course. And I will uh, and highlight the parts that <coughs> you know, came back to me. So this, this first shloka talks about the burning forest which is blazing with the rays of sun. So this, this fire is beginning to get out of control. Right? And the fire is getting bigger and bigger and it's growing higher and higher because even the devas are getting worried. It's, it's reaching the heavens. Now the next three shlokas, please bear in mind uh, as, you, as I, I translate them for you. The next three shlokas have this strange focus on clouds, and just, just watch it, observe this. This shloka says, Basava covered the sky with masses of clouds of various kinds. So they, you could actually distinguish the, the different kinds of clouds in the sky. And then rain begins to fall. The next shloka, those hundreds and thousands of clouds began to shower on the Khandakras forest. And the third shloka, again, see the emphasis on the clouds. Indra becomes angry and he collects masses of clouds and makes them shower heavy down. So the, the, the downpour is very heavier and heavier. It's raining harder and harder. And this last shloka, which I'm going to share with you, you know, when I was reading the bootleg fire, this shloka kept coming back to me because the description of the bootleg fire was exactly, to my mind, what I saw in this shloka. And here's it, here's the shloka. The flames fought with that heavy shower and the masses of clouds. So there's fire, there are clouds, there's smoke and lightning and it becomes fearful to look at. In my mind, the Khandapras fire, the Khandapras forest was, could have been, I'm going to say was, could have been a forest fire like the Bootleg fire. But what if that was the case? And the whole story has come down to us of a story of a battle between the Devas, led by Indra on one hand, and Lord Krishna and Arjuna on the other hand on the ground, with Agni trying to burn down the forest. It's, you know, it wouldn't make a very fascinating story if we said there was this big forest fire, Khandapras burned, and everyone in Khandapras died. It's a very quick story, right? But imagine when you talk about the Devas, they, it's a very dramatic story where they pick up their various weapons, there are arrows and, you know, uh, Krishna and Arjun are, are uh, wheeling around in their chariots, killing all the creatures in Khandapras forest. Agni is, is burning the forest fiercely. The clouds are amassing, the rain is falling. It's a lovely story to hear. It's really dramatic. What if the stories of the Mahabharat are based on some memory of true events and, and possibly embellished so that they get passed down as memories? from generation to generation. It's much easier to pass down stories than to pass down facts. We, we tend to uh, forget facts. Stories stay in our minds, in our memories, for years and years. And they're easier to pass down. They're also more interesting for people to, to listen to. And, and this is something which, um, which I explore in, in my books. So, um, So this is what I explored in the Mahabharata Press series. And um, I think I'll, I'll stop here. And I'd love to hear from all of you on, on you know, everything I've been talking about. I just, um, I'll very quickly play the trailer of my latest book. If that's okay, <coughs> would you like to see the trailer of the Khandra Press Conspiracy? Uh, the book is not about what I just, the book like fire, but I just told you. I, I use a different explanation for this. So basically in the Mahabharata Press series, I, I, in the Alexander Secret, which was the first book of the series that people are that slide. Um, so the first book in the series uh, was a scientific explanation of the Samudra Manthan using real science, which describes how, how the Amrit works. And then the second was the Secret of the Druids, which is why you know, I was researching in the UK, uh, which actually talks about 
the fact that we today have the technology to build one of the most powerful weapons in the Mahabharata, real science. And then uh, last November, the Kandapras conspiracy came out. So I'll very quickly play the, bit, the trailer and we can end with this. Oh, something like this? <laughs> okay. Um, 
That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know if uh, you know. If yeah, but that's also. So uh, yeah, that's a good idea. But um, what I am what I am doing is I do a lot of talks. Um, so I've got TED talks which are available on YouTube, uh, and TED talks like this which I do. I also have. Um, I started a series last January. Um, I I actually skipped that because I didn't think so. So I have a club on my website called the Quest Club, and there's a new channel I started in January called Quest Club Gold. So the Quest Club is a free club for for basically people who read my books for years. Um, and uh, the Gold is a is a subscription based channel which I started last year, and this is uh, the. Uh, a series which I started last year, which is a video series called Reveal the Mysteries of the Mahabharat, where I, uh, I actually explore the Mahabharat, uh, the, 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 I'd said in the original text of the Mahabharat, the translations, the differences in the translations, the links between the Mahabharat to the Vedas and the Purans, all of that is explored in, 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 in this series. So this is what I'm doing for now, because I don't need to approach an OTT channel or, you know, or a production house to get this going. Uh, and there's a lot of information available here as well on this on this series, and uh, yeah, let's see in the future if something like that happens. I'd, I'd be very happy. Thank you. What's your research process usually like? So when I'm when I'm researching for my uh, for my books. I'm presuming you're talking about that, right? Yeah, so because the Mahabharat Quest series explores the Mahabharat from the perspective of the lens of science, I usually start with the science. <clears throat> I typically like to start with cutting-edge scientific research, which uh, most people don't know about. So uh, so when I, when I wrote The Alexander Secret, when I was researching for The Alexander Secret, the whole science behind the object was very, very new at that point in time. Now it's, it's become even more advanced. Um, and when I, once I read the science and I research, that takes some time because I need to understand the science, um, um, which takes some time because I'm not a science student. Um, and, uh, uh, and then I, you know, if I find something in the science that explains where, you know, something from the Mahabharata, I think the two examples I gave you today, uh, both the bootleg fire and the Abel Babe examples, this is non-fiction, uh, uh, not just for the books. So I was researching for my books when I came across these two, and right? I was reading them, and then I went deeper into the science. And then it was very easy to see the similarities between the science and the stories in the Mahabharata. For my books, I go a little deeper. I actually go into the Sanskrit, because I'm writing a story which I... I try to make the story, uh, let me put it this way, I like it when readers come back and say, is this a true story? Is everything factual or you know, how much is fiction, how much is fact? If readers can't make that out, then I know I've been successful as a writer. So then I have to also go into the Sanskrit and see, can I, can I link the Sanskrit to the science? And if I can, then I start writing the story and then I bring history into it. That's the process. Yes, please. What brought your back into Mahabharata and connecting it to the science part of it? What brought my? Back into Mahabharata and okay. connecting it to the science part of it. So I think I've always been fascinated, I think all of us, I would say, have been fascinated by the stories from the Mahabharata, which you can't explain, uh, you know, logically in most cases. And um, I've, I've read a lot of books written by Western authors, which try and explain Western mythology through science. So one of the, if you're interested in the subject, uh, one of the best books on this, which must be written in the 60s, I think, is a book called Hamlet's Mill, which explores mythologies around the world and links it to astronomy, <coughs> astronomical events that have happened in the past, uh, which, to which mythology was developed. And um, I wanted to see if, if there was anything in India which you know, explore our own traditions, our, our epics, uh, especially, specifically the Mahabharata, that where my interest lay much more. But I couldn't find anything, and that's when my research stuck. I said, okay, I, I think if I can't find anything that links science and mythology, maybe I should start researching it. And that's where it started. Uh, 
when a lot of people tell ki uh, Mahabharat doesn't have any scientific explanation, how do you counter them and how do you challenge and uh, ask them questions and what is your process to convince them that, uh, that there is a science behind Mahabharat? So, so one thing I, I like to be very careful about is not to not to make claims which cannot be found, you know, backed up by science. Um, and it was, that's, uh, it's not correct. But where I can find a scientific explanation, so today, for example, it would be very, uh, I would be very keen uh, you know, to see if someone can challenge me, for example, to uh, prove wrong if I speculate that the story of Shikhandi, that Shikhandi was actually a male sailor of Um So if someone says, no, you're wrong, I'd say, okay, please tell me where the science is wrong. So it's very difficult for someone to refute that. So I'm not making a loose claim. Mm -hmm. Similarly, for the Thunder Press fire, when I talk about the bootleg fire, again, this is a scientific explanation over here. And this is real science, and it's not science fiction. So as long as I know that uh, uh, whatever I'm explaining is based on, on real science, um, it, gives me, uh, it, uh, it gives me a foundation which is, which is pretty solid. So even the, in my books, I know I'm writing fiction. Uh, but the science underpinning that fiction is all real science. I, I mean, uh, my latest book, The Counterplus Conspiracy, for example, I put up a bibliography uh, which has more than 200 white papers listed in the bibliography. Uh, so I can challenge anyone to say, prove the science wrong. And I, I validate the science with an expert. So the Samudramantan theory, for example, that I came up with was validated by the head of uh, Southeast Asia for the WHO, who is a biologist, who you know, who went through my theory and said yes, it's a scientific accurate. So when I'm debating with someone, it's usually based on facts, not on uh, you know, uh, not on just pure speculation. And which is why even in my talk, I'm very clear when I was speculating and when I was not. Uh, so that's really how I tackle it. Yeah. And answer your question. So I have one question. Yes, please. As you mentioned, like personality swap between uh, Shikhandi and Yaksha, right? So I want to understand, like, what sort of a pow powers were those? Is there any mention of that? Because people they were really advanced. They did they perform any surgery or like those were really powers? So uh, the the story of the Yaksha, I think, is is fictitious, very honestly, because if if Shikhandi had a natural genetic condition. That change would have happened anyway. But bringing a yaksh into it and bringing Lord Shiva into it becomes easy to explain to somebody who doesn't know. Now, you must also remember that you know whenever the Mahabharata was written, uh, they may have had advanced science and technology, but we don't know what the nature of that technology was. You know, so in some of my test talks, I've even, I've even speculated that uh, maybe the technology was very different from ours. Uh, maybe it was more nature-based. So we don't know whether they knew about five alpha reductives at that point in time. For example, today we know about it. The genetic conditions are different. So is it possible then that this whole story of the Yaksh is to explain that, OK, this is how the princess became a prince. And this is, uh, you know, this was her destiny to become a man. How did the destiny happen? Lord Shiva decreed that she would become a man. So the st whole story of Shikandin, uh, Shikandini, uh, or Shikandini, is is really about trying to explain something which may not have been possible to explain otherwise. So I don't look for the explanation of how that swap happened. I, for me, the science, the scientific explanation is more about whether Shikandi himself or Shikandini herself had that genetic condition that caused uh, the, the the gender change from the female to male. So, uh, during your research, uh, I'm sure that you have come across so many different sources. Uh, one of the key elements in the Mahabharata also is the power of mantras, right? So everyone says this and something happens. So during the course of the research, have you ever come across something that you thought uh, was probably documented sometime in, in history, maybe the power of sound, and sound allows you to do certain things which, Today, we are unable to fathom. 
So, uh, so, so even even for example, like like a chair or a table, they all have sound waves, and you can move objects with sound. And if you have the right pronunciations, let let's let's take the example from Harry Potter, right? Of course, it's 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 very fictional and stuff. Yeah. But it's the same concept in a way. So, have you come across something like that where where sound ex where where there's an explanation based on sound? Uh, yeah, I. Uh, that's a great question. Um, Arjun, and uh, do you guys mind if I show you some slides? Yeah, because I, I can explain better using slides. Because I actually talk about this. I didn't have, I didn't think I would pack so much information in today. Can you just put up the lights in front, please? So this is actually a field which I've, I've, I've researched, and um, um, you're very right. You know. Um, Science tells us that we that everything in the universe vibrates. We are all we are all beings of we are frequencies basically, right? And we know we know the impact that uh, that sound waves and frequencies have through resonance. And uh, and because everything in our in the universe is levitating uh, is is vibrating and has a frequency, uh, there are a lot of applications of sound, and I'll very quickly go through this because this, there's a quite a bit of science here, but uh, this research blew my mind, so I'm sharing it with you because this kind of directly answers your question. So, for example, we are now, scientists today are working on sonic levitation. This is the apparatus used to suspend solid objects in midair using only sound waves. And ultrasound in medicine, we're very familiar with this machine because we've seen it, you know, um, on some occasion or the other, uh, but there are a lot of other uh, uh, applications of ultrasound which a lot of people don't know about. So, for example, you have high-intensity uh, focused ultrasound, which has a whole bunch of applications which are over here. These are all scientific. These are proved by the FDA. So, these are all things which are actually being, the sound is being used for these. You have kilohertz frequency ultrasonic devices which which are used for tissue cutting. Right? Again, use of sound. You have sound and propulsion, which has been, you know, there are lots of experiments happening over here. And I'll show you two very quick videos, these are 10 second videos, which show you how ultrasound is used to propel small, very small particles. This is the first video. You watch how the change happens. Now, when the sound waves are applied, see what happens. The entire direction gets reversed. And here, if you look at this, the next video, you will see how the partic micro particles move in you know, they come together. Just watch this. This is where the sound waves are being applied. So there's a lot of there's a lot of work happening in sound. So here, in the field of thermogenetics, neurons in the brain can be manipulated across different species. So different types of cells, brain cells, heart cells, any kind of cell can be activated using ultrasound in this method. Then you have something called sonothermogenetics, which can be used to control behavior. That is very interesting because this targets specific areas of the brain deep inside the brain, again using ultrasound, and it's used for cell-specific brain therapy. Then you have things called acoustic tweezers. And these are used to manipulate small particles uh, suspended in liquid. Not like the propulsion I showed you, but to do different things. And then you have acoustoelectric nano tweezers, which use electronic, you know, electrical uh, fields which move particles around. Now, this is a crazy, mind-blowing uh, technology which is going to come out soon. This is where ultrasound is going to help visually impaired people to see. You probably think I'm crazy talking about this, but you know what happens today is uh, ophthalmologists use electric technology. Very minute electrodes are planted in the retina. If the retina is healthy, only this, only then it works. But what happens is, you know, through uh, those electrodes, electrical currents are used to send uh, you know, the signals up the optic nerve to the brain, so people can see. But it's invasive. It's painful. It's you know it's it's a pain. Now people, the scientists are working on developing ultrasound devices which can be you know worn, say say a hand or a wrist or somewhere on the body, 
and these will send ultrasound waves into the into the retina and that will cause mechanical pressure the mechanical pressure is then converted by the optic nerve into electrical signals which go to the brain and help the visually impaired person see it's amazing stuff that's happening in sound cancer immunotherapy platforms are being developed using sound sound is being used to regrow bone to turn stem cells into bone cells using ultrasound right so i know i can keep going on and on about this but there's a lot of stuff happening when you know where sound is concerned and um in, it is very interesting in the 19th century there was an american inventor called john keely who was a bit disparaged because of circumstances but he claimed to have invented a technology which used the power of sound to lift heavy objects to power enormous machines to to uh, crush rock and his ambition was to build automobiles which ran on sound we would have had a much cleaner earth if he succeeded now what is very interesting about john keely is he did not di divulge the secret of his technology these are his machines but his uh, the the demos that he conducted to scientists are very very well documented now the reason why we, you don't know much about keely today is because yeah, he refused to divulge it even though we didn't have twitter in those days he was trolled for fellow so a lot of people say he's a fraud he doesn't want to talk about a secret because he doesn't have a secret technology and so on his investors uh, pulled out and uh, and he died a poor man and he took his secret with him to the grave now what's very interesting where john keely is concerned is his machines could only be in operated so each machine was attuned to an individual which meant that there were machines which keely could operate which no one else could operate and there were other machines which another person could operate and he wouldn't be able to operate right so he was actually somehow tuning it to the person's individual frequency now we don't know how he did it but this is how it worked there was there would be some machines where he would do a demo and there be other machines where he say you try it. you know you can't do it on this you can do it in this machine is very interesting and again you know coming back to the mahabharat when you look at the mahabharat and even the quran you have these stories but let's stick to the mahabharat for now you have so many instances so this what the one of the biggest instances of sound you know celestial weapons and mantras that you would say um there's a story about arjun after lord krishna passed from this world arjun was tasked to go to dwarka because dwarka was sinking and he had to uh rescue the elderly the women and the children of the vishnus and escort them now they didn't need any other protection because i mean this is the guy who single handedly uh, defeated the entire kaurav army at viratnagar the battle of viratnagar arjun by himself defeated them all right uh, it was only on the back of kurukshetra battle field he developed cold feet and then the bhagavad gita was told to him but this was his part so you don't need anyone else but this is what happened as they passed through a forest they were attacked by bandits and arjun had been cursed to forget his mantras and he forgot because of that he could not recall his celestial he couldn't recall the mantras he couldn't recall the celestial weapons and he was defeated by the bandits who carried away half the people he was supposed to be protecting the same thing happened with karan karan was was cursed and he forgot his mantra he wanted to use the bhamastra but he could not use it because when his wheel got stuck in the mud he forgot because again he had been cursed so you have all these very interesting and of course you got this famous story uh, of, i don't know how famous it is but it's a very fascinating story which is there in the shrimad bhagavatam and it's also uh, in, in some in some of the other quran's about uh, the birth of vritra have you heard the story again this is an amazing uh, example of sound uh, so the the rishi crushed it had a son called vritra who was killed by indra and uh, uh, so prashna was obviously furious with indra and he said i'm going to make sure indra dies so he decided to do a, a ritual to to create an asur who would be born with the destiny to kill indra that's a foolproof way to kill indra right if this guy is born with the destiny indra is going to die so he started the the whole uh, sacrifice and the whole process and started reciting the mantras but despite being a maharishi he made a small mistake he said indra 
instead of Indra. Now, just because of the small change, you say, what is the difference between Indra and Indra? But Sanskrit is such a language that the whole meaning changed from enemy of Indra to Indra who is an enemy. So instead of being born with the destiny to kill Indra, he got born with the destiny to be killed by Indra. And that was the story of Ritra, who was born with that destiny. Now it's fascinating, you know, these small examples which you, which you read about, is there something, something behind it? Is it, today we are, we are relearning the power of sound. Uh, is it possible that, you know, our people in ancient times actually knew it? May, that's what I say, you know, I like to speculate that their technology is different from ours. Uh, and like I said, you know, if Kili had developed cars that ran an automobile, the world would be a very different place. We wouldn't be talking about fossil fuels and, and uh, you know, global warming and stuff and pollution uh, in the 21st century. But yeah, thanks for asking that question. You, know, you, you got me all excited. <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of this stuff. So I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Yes, please. I'm very curious, uh, do you see any differences that talks about internet and AI that is emerging? Sorry, sorry, say that again, please. Do you see any differences that uh, the emerging technologies, uh, you know, uh, internet and AI, that uh, we could see some difference in our world? So, internet, I, I, no, I can't, I can't see any reference to the internet in the world. But uh, but you did have uh, you did have very strange things like which is which is actually something that's that has been experimented on. So for example, Sanjay was able to um, to narrate to Dhritarashtra everything that was happening on the on the battlefield uh, in Kurukshetra, and uh, uh, there are actually experiments which have been done and. This is something you won't find in mainstream science because scientists are very reluctant to talk about it because they don't want to be, you know, branded as being a lunatic fringe. But these are scientific experiments that have been carried out where uh, people who are apart, you know, they've been they've been put in different rooms or maybe even in different locations, and something enables people to be able to see what's happening with the other person. There, there are lots of documented cases of this. And I'm talking about when these documentations being done by scientists, not by lay people. These are people who have actually done this. There are some very interesting books written about this. Now, the thing is that we don't understand how this happens. And I could go, I could go into a whole you know, lecture or discussion on quantum physics over here because there, is, there is, seems to be a link to the quantum world uh, where you have something called quantum entanglement. So, you know, so it's possible that if there's entanglement at the quantum level, then that feeds up into the into the macro uh, part also. But again, there's a lot of speculation in this. Uh, so there are things that that are there in the Mahabharat which could possibly have scientific explanations, but maybe we just don't have the knowledge yet for for all of that. So long answer to a short question. I hope I've been able to answer. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, it was a lovely session. Thank you. It's, it's not a question which I'm. <coughs> I'm not going to ask. Rather, see, there's this book which was published in the 1970s right. by a doctor. Uh, he's a medical practitioner. His name is Dr. Vartak. Now, he, he has written a book named Swayamru. Okay. That is basically on the exploits of Bhima. Okay. Exploits of? Bhim. Okay. And how Bhim is usually known, shown as a dim you know, angry at and you know, all kinds of nonsense. And only guy who's with enormous uh, appetite for food. But he has explained it very well and I think well, since you have been doing on this Mahabharata, it would be very good for you to refer that book once. Because in that, you know, he has, he has also explained being a medical doctor, hmm. how you do not need a, a sperm to actually impregnate a woman. And he has actually explained it in, you know, giving examples of many bird species. And even few amphibian species who don't need, you know, any external agent to impregnate them. So I think that would be a great thing if you could get that book somewhere. It's, a, it's by Dr. Vartak and it's called Swayam Book. Swayam so Book. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a book in Marathi. Thank you for the reference. I'll definitely look it up. Definitely will.
we talked about the, the monolithic structures, Stonehenge and the Great Pyramid, and uh, talks about an advanced civilization that disappeared somehow. I'm curious about what do you think, what happened to that uh, knowledge, where did it go? So again, there is, you know, if you look in, our, in, the, in, the, in the mythologies of different cultures, you find a lot of, uh, a lot of similarities. I don't know if I have something over here which can... Um, um, if I can find it, I'll share, I'll share it with you, because I'll just speak about it. But... Um, Yeah, so I'll just um, I'll just share a couple of things, and again I'll just uh, so when you look across the mythologies of different cultures, you find some uncanny similarities. So, for example, in number seven, um, you have uh, the seven old men of the Mongols. In Siberia, you have uh, seven levels of the underworld, uh, which you also have in India. You have seven levels of Patanok. You've got the seven sons of God in Mughal, you've got the seven supreme gods in the Yakut. In India, you've got the Saptarishis, you've got the seven Adityas in the, in the Rig Ved. Um, the Mahabharata is a different number, but in the Rig Ved, it's seven Adityas. You've got the seven levels of Patanlok. In uh, Mesopotamia, again, you've got the seven sages. And one of the things about the seven, seven sages, and then again, you've got, uh, and then in the Bible also, you've got uh, creation in seven days. Uh, Noah had uh, seven days to prepare for the flood and so on and you know, you've got, the number seven comes everywhere and uh, uh, one of the things about the, you know, when you talk about what happened to that civilization and the reason why I showed you the number seven is that in Mesopotamia, for example, there's the story of the seven men who came from the sea and educated the Mesopotamians in different arts, agriculture, metal, weapons, you know, all kinds of things, they passed on knowledge uh, to them. Um, in India, in India also, it was, uh, you know, it was uh, the Satrishis who were responsible for different aspects of creation, you know, and uh, propagation of the, of, of the human race. So, again, there's, there's a lot of speculation in this, in this field, but if one was to go deeper into the, uh, the, the mythological comparisons and say, and, and look at these, it would seem that there seemed to be a lot of knowledge giving, a knowledge sharing that was happening uh, thousands of years ago by these mysterious people who used to come from nowhere and go back to nowhere. No one knew about them. Who were these people? So were these the, the, the remnants of some older ancient civilization? Um, the, other, the other way to, you know, to speculate, and this is not speculation because we don't have uh, evidence for any of this, the other way to speculate is we didn't know about people like the Denisovans, who are people like us, and humans like us. Uh, we didn't know about them until 2009. Uh, is it possible that beings like them, other humans like, like, like them, were also around? Because it's very interesting, there is something which genetic experts call a ghost population, which means we have not found any archaeological or fossil remains of these people. But the, just like humans, modern humans today have Denisovan DNA. The Denisovans have DNA from what is known as a super archaic population. Their DNA is in the Denisovan genome. So we know that they existed genetically. We just haven't found the fossilized remains yet. So when you look at, you know, beings like the Devas, for example, the Devas were not gods. It's very clear. They were, you know, they were mortal. And, um, and, 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 and actually when you look at the word Deva itself in Sanskrit, uh, Deva can be taken to mean God in the context of things, in the word names like Mahadeva. Mahadeva is the great God. But when it's applied to Indra, you know, and the other Adityas, and, uh, uh, you know, it's more likely to be in the context of the meaning of Deva as Shining One. Deva means Shining One. 
And, uh, and you'll find this reference to them in a lot of their, they, they talk about their luster, the shine on their faces. In fact, Agni's motivation for burning down the Kharbat Prasad forest was he had lost his shine, he had lost his luster. So, when you look at all of this, is it possible that some of these beings were actually humans like us, but maybe with an advanced technology? I remember what Arthur C. Clarke said, you, uh, you know, any, any kind of good technology is like magic. I don't forget the exact words he used. But uh, uh, for, for people who don't have the technology, if you go to, uh, even today in the 21st century, you have advanced technology in parts of the, many parts of the world, and you've got tribes in parts of the world who don't know what that technology is. Uh, in the 80s, there was this movie called The Gods Must Be Crazy. I don't know how many of you have heard of this, where a Coke bottle drops in, you know, in, in the middle of a tribe in Africa, and then they start worshipping it. Right? It's, and it's, it's, uh, it may sound, it's, it was a funny movie, but it has a very deep meaning that what we don't understand, we could start worshipping, and, and then the devas instead of shining ones become gods. Right? So, so we have to keep all these things in mind. So there, there's a lot of, uh, I won't say evidence, but there are lots of hints that there was advanced technology happening. I mean, things like Balbek, for example, which are, there's nothing that can explain that. There's absolutely nothing that can explain that, other than there was some population thousands of years ago, who had the advanced knowledge and technology to be able to do stuff like that. Yeah, so I, haven't, I know I haven't completely answered your question, but I've just given you lots of food for thought. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir.
And now we are proceeding with the felicitation process. So I'd like to call upon stage officer to felicitate uh,